many of the great masterpieces of Beethoven are a struggle in the soul. It's soul music, music of the soul. It's a soul struggling with fate, struggling with the order of things, trying, arguing with the order of things, and finally submitting, sort of submitting. But you can hear the end of the... the um, Moonlight Sonata, that, that, that minor chord on which it finishes, the, the tempestuous chords. And finally, the, it's the Fifth Symphony. Is, is, the Fifth Symphony ends in triumph. This ends in some, the Moonlight Sonata ends in some darkness. The Passionata Sonata ends in real darkness. It's, uh, it's the revolution, it, he, he was writing at the time of the revolution, the French Revolution, He's, the, he's kind of the French Revolution music. And the, it's a revolution which has difficulty, which is struggling with admitting that God is master. But it does, he does admit. Finally, Beethoven does, does admit and submit. But uh, it's a struggle. Um, this is uh, just a revision. So it shouldn't be too difficult. There's a Latin saying, Plenus vente non studet lemente. Uh, a full stomach doesn't like studying. I, I, all I can think of is the siesta. You know, all, I want is, <laughs> all I want is to sleep. But it, it, um, you've seen it all, basically. But the, the plan is very simple. Obviously, you've got certain headings down the middle in, in black or purple. Uh, black headings and then purple underheadings. And then on each side, you've got the different versions of each of these things. So it should be very easy... After you've um, after the last couple of days to run down this, but it is uh, maybe it will be handy. It's an interesting. I'm interested in finding out how useful it is. So you've got the main headings, which are God and man, redemption, faith, church, and the world. The world comes at the bottom. It's not all that interesting. The struggles of today, the great struggles of uh, it, it, the great struggles of today. Uh, a tormented modern world, religious basically. People are wrestling, people are trying to get rid of God and it's difficult and they're having to fight to get rid of God. That's what today is about. And it, it makes life darker and more hopeless and, and people are more and more desperate, more and more crazy, more and more desperate as they get rid of God. Beethoven was struggling <laughs> but he finally, he admits God, so to speak. Um, but uh, Vatican II is a classic example of shaking off God. So let's have a look. God. Um, for the Catholic religion, he's the supreme being who, who can only will his own same glory, his own unchanging glory, his own changeless glory. Same was a shorter word which would fit in, but it should have been changeless. God can only will his own changeless glory. He can't be taught or learned or gained from anything else. It's impossible. But Vatican II is the supreme being who wills all creation for man. Vatican II, that's Gaudium et Spes, says that God wants everything for man, as though man is the center and not God. No, God is, creates, man comes from God and is due to go back to God. Man is not the center, God is the center. But for Vatican II, man is the center. Then creation. All creatures exist, Catholic religion, to enable God to share his infinite bliss. God creates in order that there will be angels and human beings, rational beings, capable of sharing in his bliss and who will share in his bliss. But for them to be rational beings, they've got to have free will, which means that both the angels, some of the angels, a third of the angels, they say, and a large part of mankind will turn away from God. But for God, those who accept and accept his offer, his stupendous offer, really, uh, we got none, no, none of us have any idea what it is to see God. The vision, the beatific vision, is uh, stupendous. But for, the, for those who will accept God's offer to gaze on him for eternity, um, it's worth it, so to speak, even if a large number of souls and of angels don't want to. But he can't have, he can't, beings can't share in his heaven who weren't free. 
He can't have dogs in his heaven. He can't have cats in his heaven. Much to the distress of little old ladies. <laughs> the little old ladies, whether they read it, will forget about their dogs and their cats. When they see God, they're going to forget. They don't realize. They, 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 little dog or cat must be, partake part of heaven. No. Um, for Vatican II, all creatures of God are for the sake of man. You know, yes, Man as secondarily, but for the sake of man, for the sake of God. So again, they're displacing, Vatican II is displacing the center from God to man. Man is not the center of creation. And all creatures of God are for the sake of man achieving God. That's true. The whole, the whole of the, this earth is like a trampoline for men to jump on, but to jump on in order to go to heaven. Therefore God is the, is the end and not man. Uh, Christ, he's the second, in Catholicism, he's the second divine person, true God by the Trinity, and true man by Mary, that we know, true God of God, light of God, true God of true God, and true man by, by uh, taking a human nature from Mary. For, for, for Vatican II, you saw at the end of last yesterday's, year, he's perhaps not, perhaps not quite God. Certainly man, for man. The emphasis is absolutely on Christ as man and not on Christ as God. But Christ took flesh in order to take us men to God, not to, take, not to stop at man. Man is, man is nothing without God, except original sin. He's a package of original sin without God. Man is for God and with God. The Incarnation. Uh, the, the Catholic is for Catholics. It's God becoming man. Why man to be able to die for man's salvation? Had our Lord not been um, man, uh, if he was remain God, he he couldn't have suffered. He couldn't have died. He couldn't have paid for our sins. So um, that's what he came became. Propter nos hominis et propter nostrum salutum. Qui incarnatus is. We've just been singing it in, in the church. Qui incarnatus propter nos hominis et propter nostrum salutum. He took flesh for us, for us men and for our salvation. That's the Catholic version. But for Vatican II, he's God becoming man to make man more man. Always the center on man, 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 man. Gaudium et Spes above all. Gaudium et Spes was one of the last documents of Vatican II and it's one of the worst because... Uh, at the end of Vatican II, the bad guys were no longer hiding their game. They were, they were come, coming out more and more in the open. They needed less and less to hide it because the, the, uh, there was a madness taking hold of the bishops and they were, they were um, more and more uh, happy to take on the new religion. At the beginning, the bad guys had had to go quietly, quietly, quietly catch a monkey. But at the end, forget about trying going quietly catch a monkey. It's almost out in the open. They're, they're out for man, man, man. And the madness that took every... There's a, some of you will remember, years ago it's now, um, the three vol the trilogy of Michael Davis. Um, God Godless, um, Cranmer's Godly Order, Pope John's Council, and Pope Paul's New Mass. You may remember there was an edition of uh, Pope John's New Mass, uh, Pope John's Council, which had a cartoon on the front. And the cartoon showed the bishops in procession entering the Vatican, and they were all with mitre and cross, crozier, and they were all very correct and proper. And then he sees them coming out of the Vatican, throwing away their mitres, throwing away their crozers, hiking up their cassocks and, and hot rocking and rolling. It was a marvellous cartoon, and it expressed exactly that. The, 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 the bishops were all very correct and proper with the old religion when they entered the, Vat, entered the Vatican Council, but by the end of the Vatican Council, they were rocking and rolling. They were joining in the modern world, and they were throwing away the old religion. That's what happened. God becoming man to make man more man. It's, it's, it's lunar. It's mad, if you think about it. Obviously, our Lord is, took, was there to take man to God, not to take man to man, but, but that's the modern idea. Man is everything. We come to man, and we've got person, liberty, dignity, mind, conscience, and sin. You've seen all this yesterday. It shouldn't, shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be strange. What is man for, for the truth and for the Catholics? He is a rational animal, 
created by God, for God, but fallen by Adam. Original sin. Try to educate children without, without taking into account original sin. It's, it's going to ruin them. Because the children are little angels, but they're also little monkeys. And they need spanking. Uh, the boys is in particular. The boys need spanking. Otherwise, they're not going to grow up straight. Um, so, because they've got original sin in them. They're not just little angels. Of course, they're irresistible at times, but that's when they're playing the little angel. But you turn your back and they're going to be playing the little devil. So, man has is, is got original sin. It's very clear. He's a rational animal, that's his definition. He's created by, then supernaturally created by God, by, created by God for God. Man is designed to come f down from God, through this earth and back to God. The same God. For, for Vatican II, man is the center of creation, the chief glorifier of God by what he, man, is. So man is glorious, and because man is glorious, Secondarily, God gets glory because God was the maker of man. But the primary glory in, in Vatican II goes to man. No, no way. That's complete, that's, that really is turning things upside down, to put man at the center. The person. Uh, with angels, the person, uh, the, the, the person is a, a rational um, person. To, a, a, Subsist a, subs a substance of a rational nature. That's the, that's the proper definition of a person. So uh, the, both there are three persons in God. The word can be applied to the three persons of God. Every angel is a person because of his rational nature. He's a substance and he has a rational nature. And every man that is a substance with a rational nature is a person. That's the correct understanding. Why? Because of his rational nature. It's reason that makes the person, not liberty. Liberty is the manifestation of reason, but it's reason that the, the, the spiritual is the spiritual dimension of man, which makes him capable of God, and which is, is his potential dignity if he fills that spiritual nature with God. But it's a ruination if he fills it with the devil. Uh, for, but he, if man, person is the supreme creature for Vatican II, the su supreme creature by his freedom. That's the modern perspective. Not by his reason, which is objective and submits us to God, but by his freedom, which makes him free to do what he thinks is best. Freedom by his freedom, more free than God's, because man can actually choose evil, whereas God cannot choose evil. So freedom is, for modern, for, for Vatican II, freedom is the, like the modern man. But it's a, it's a wrong perspective. The freedom is... Uh, a, a, a faculty of free will given us to choose everything that will take us to God. Again, that, that puts something bigger and higher above man, and that's what the modern perspective doesn't want. The one perspective is man. Is that man is the highest. No. No, God is the highest. Liberty. Liberty is an endowment of free will to human beings given... Uh, uh, a free, the free will gives the ability, but not the right, to choose evil. Because of free will, we can choose evil. Free will is a danger for all of us until death, because we might choose what will take us to hell. We, are, we have the ability, not the right, the ability to choose what will take us to hell. Um, many, men, many men use their free will for that. They don't want God. So... Um, the ability, but not the right, to choose evil. For, for, for Vatican II, it's the ability and right of man to choose between good and evil. That's maybe uh, exaggerating a little. That's maybe uh, not exactly what Vatican II actually says, but it's where it, it, but the idea of liberty that Vatican II has comes out of that. That's, that's spelling out Vatican II, not necessarily what Vatican II actually says. That would have been a bit much for, for, for the Council Fathers. So, as I say, at the beginning of the Council, the bad guys were very were careful with how they proposed their upturning, uh, overturning of the Church. But by the end of the Council, it was very clear. But I, I'm not sure if it went as far as to say 
the forbidden uh, liberty. But it, it, it is in effect, notice, it is in effect what they're saying. Um, dignity. Uh, dignity of, of man is his, uh, for Catholics, his potential to actually choose good, and by that means to deserve heaven. He's got the, a faculty to choose good or bad. If he act, if, 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 if his act of choosing is an act of choosing good, well then he'll go deserve heaven. And that's why, uh, that's where his dignity is. But for modern man, the, the damned soul in hell has just as much dignity as the soul in heaven. But that's, that's nonsense. The dignity is not in the faculty which is given to him. The dignity of man is what he makes, or what the use he makes lies in, in the use he makes of his life. The tramp, the, the, tramp, the, the drunken, drugged tramp that you might meet on the streets, he still has the dignity of a man, yes, but he's not made yet much use of that dignity. And then, I mean, I talk of the tramp in the street because it's obvious, but the banker who's got a nice dark suit and a lovely house and everything, that banker, oof, has he got dignity when he's using his power as a banker to wreck, to wreck the economy, to wreck men, to put, put money constantly in front of men? He hasn't got much dignity either. He may have less dignity than the poor tramp in the street. So to talk about the tramp is to talk about externals. But if you talk about if you talk about internals, there are a lot of very respectable, damned people walking up and down the streets, and they 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 don't have much human dignity. They they may they they present themselves well, and everybody respects them because they have so much power. But internally, they're a wreck. They're a complete wreck. And they're empty of human dignity. They are great mistreaters of their fellow human beings, always putting money first, completely disregarding of, of, of men, of, hum, of human beings, of their fellow men. The, then mind. The, it's the spiritual faculty of man designed by God. It's God who designed the human mind. Um, designed by God for objective truth. I'll tell you a little story about Archbishop Lefebvre. I was once, uh, only once, travelling with him by our airplane to uh, Ireland. In order, I was going to interp help interpret for him in Ireland. He was going to give a conference. We were way back in the 1970s, early 1970s. And we were on London Airport, and there was a Concorde on the airport about, about to take off in front of us. And the Concorde lit up and began firing engines in order to take off. And the ground shook. It was, it was like... It was, and our, our little aeroplane behind <laughs> shook also. And by the t when, when, the, when the Concorde had finally turned off, t taken off, I turned to Archbishop Lefebvre and said, uh, he was sitting next to me, of course, I said, I said, oh, what, what man is to be able to invent, so, to create such a machine? And he quietly answered, huh. Well, God is to be able to create man. That's it. Let's see right there. So, um, the, the dignity is the, the, the ability, the, its potential dignity to choose good and its actual dignity choosing the good. And the mind is the spiritual faculty of man designed by God for objective truth. The mind is designed for truth, obviously. Seems obvious. But then men fill it with, fill it with lies. And that takes away the mind's dignity. For the, what is that, the mind for Vatican II? It's a spiritual faculty, you saw Immanuel Kant, incapable of objective truth, fabricating subjective truth. So for modern man, the mind is a fabricator, not a receiver, uh, a, a, a registerer, something, a faculty that registers the truth that's outside it, that acknowledges the truth that's outside it. No, 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 no. The mind is independent of objective truth for modern man. And it fabricates its own truth. It's a, it's a faculty. It's a it's a fabricator. Um, that's that's deadly. Complete, absolutely deadly. But of course, I was saying to you yesterday. Uh, whenever it comes to actual living, the mind is constantly recognizing reality. If I said that everything that on the table had just been put in front of me was not actually food, I'd be pretty hungry by the time the meal finished, because I wouldn't have been able to eat anything, because I'm not sure it's food. 
but my senses are telling me. So of course, we trust our senses all day long. And we trust the capacity of our mind to read behind the senses what things are, objective truth. But modern man, no, no, no. That's mo the mind is incapable of its object. The modern man paralyzes man's highest faculty, pretending that it can and does make its own truth. This, that's, it's not common sense. People live by their common sense, and the philosophy professors in modern universities live by talking nonsense. They're paid well by parents to teach their children nonsense. Does that make sense? That's what happens. How can parents still go, still still be sending their children to these universities, which wreck their children's common sense, as well as their faith. Conscience. We saw yesterday, that for Catholicism, it's the voice in man telling him God's objective and external right and wrong, telling him what is right and wrong in this situation. In the, uh, what how the general print, how the Ten Commandments apply in this situation. And if I begin to get it wrong, my conscience will warn me, watch out, you're, you're not getting it right. So conscience is a voice, in principle, telling me what is objective. But for modern man again, it's going to be the faculty that tells me what I want, what, I, what for me is right and wrong. Not what for God is right and wrong, but what for man is right and wrong. And so um, the conscience, the internal faculty of man, the subjective judge of right and wrong. Not the teller of God's objective right and wrong, but the fabricator of my right and wrong. I gave you the classic example, which is a, a, a very hurtful example for many people, of uh, artificial means of birth control. Many parents have themselves convinced, many poor parents trapped in the big city, unable because of the rent or because of money or whatever, maybe unable to have many children, but they've got to live in the big city, they're, they're caught, they feel caught. I've got to be able to avoid children. I've got to. It's right for me to, to avoid children. So, but the subjective conscience is taking over from God's, what the, God, what the church teaches and what is objectively right and wrong. Finally, sin. Sin is a first and foremost an offence against God for the Catholic Church. It's not first an offence against neighbour, it's an offence against God, and then against my own soul, and only thirdly against neighbour, which hurts not God himself, because he can be hurt in himself, that's true, but it hurts him in his creation. Luther d deprived God of the glory of millions and millions of souls. Uh, arriving in paradise. He cut, he's, he's still cutting many souls off from salvation. He hurts God in his creation. For, for Vatican II, sin cannot offend or hurt God. Again, that, that, that terrible trickery. God can't be hurt, therefore sin doesn't hurt him. No. God can't be hurt in himself, but he can be hurt in his creation. Sin hurts him in his creation. Because God is impassable. So that's, that's one of those uh, tricks. Of, they knew their theology. The people that wrote Vatican II and made up Vatican II, they knew their theology. They're villains. They were villains. They couldn't have done Vatican II if they hadn't used the theology of truth to twist into the lies which would be persuasive because they resemble the truth. The redemption. Um, the redemption is Christ's payment of sinful man's unpayable debt to God. Man sins. He incurs, the sin is primarily against God. It incurs a debt to God, which man can't pay. Man is capable of offending God, but he can't pay the debt. The elephant is capable of falling into a trap, but it, an elephant trap, but he can't climb out again. Man falls into an, 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 an elephant trap when he sins. He's, he, he's, he's incurring a debt which he can't pay. So the redemption is Christ's paying that debt for every single man ever alive, from Adam down to the end of the world. Christ paid in his own suffering and death. Um, for the Vatican II, the redemption. Since man doesn't hurt God because he can't hurt God because God is unhurtable, 
then there's no need of redemption. So redemption is wiped out. Um, in which case the cross, what is the cross? For Christ, of course, the cross is Christ's sacrificial death. He sacrificed himself, making that payment. It's by his tremendous death on the cross that Christ paid to God for uh, all the sins of men. The theologians say they're undoubtedly right. If, if Christ has simply pricked his thumb and caused himself a tiny bit of pain, since he's God, that would actually be enough. But he wouldn't have persuaded us, of course. In order to persuade human beings that what he was doing was pain, it had to be an atrocious death, death by crucifixion. Remember that uh, Christ could have chosen to be incarnate in any age, in any time, in any place, and he could have chosen uh, cultures which, which, where capital punishment was not by the cross, where capital punishment was by hanging, which is much less, much less painful than the cross. The cross is a particularly painful form of death. The, the, the body is wrapped between... It, it, it's, um, the doctors tell us that um, the, uh, if, if the body... In order to breathe, the, the crucified man has to push up on the nail in his feet. He has to push up from his feet. And then he's got room to breathe. He can breathe again. So he begins to breathe. But then there's terrible cramp. He gets cramp in his legs. He has to let go on his legs so that the he, so that to relieve his legs, and then he can't breathe again. So it's a, it's an alternation between cramp and asphyxia. It's it's a horrible death. But that's the culture in which Christ chose to die in order to pay that debt and to make it clear that he was paying that debt. No, uh, for modern for for Vatican II, the cross was simply a demonstration of God's solidarity with man and his love for man. Man, 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 man. It's true that Christ died for man, but he died for man in order for man to be able to go to God. Man was not the final purpose of, of the terrible death of our Lord on the cross, but his father was the purpose. He was dying for, his fa for the glory of his father, so that men would be able to glorify his father happily in heaven for eternity. And that's what Christ did for us. What is Mass? Mass for Catholics is, is the necessary continuation of Christ's redeeming sacrifice or the necessary ongoing application of the ongoing application of the cross. The cross happened. It needs to be applied, revived, re renewed always in all times, which is why the Mass is celebrated all over the world and will be celebrated at the end of the world. And when it stops being celebrated, the world will have to come to an end. Padre Pio, you may remember, said, the world can sooner do without the light of the sun, without the light and warmth of the sun, than it can do without the sacrifice of the Mass. That's the importance of the Mass. But for the modern world, uh, for, for Vatican II, again, that's not directly in the texts, of Vatican II, but it's certainly in the nature of the new Mass, which came out of Vatican II in 1969. The Mass is man's self-glorification, and it actually, and this is blasphemy, puts God in debt to man. <laughs> You're right to laugh, Walter. You're right to laugh. I mean, it, it, it's, you laugh in order not to cry. What can you do with these people? Um, they're, twi they're twisting everything around to put man above God and man in the place of God. Man's self-glorification putting God in debt to man. And finally, what's grace? Grace is a quality of the human soul. It's man's supernatural participation in God, but it's outside of God. Man is not taking part in God himself, but it's a participation in what is of God, uh, outside of God. It's important not to think that we are actually, where well, we actually become God by sanctifying grace. No. Sanctifying grace is a quality of our own, which is, is, belongs in our soul when we're in the state of grace. It's a quality of soul which we lose when we fall into the state of sin. But it is a quality which enables us to participate in God. Um, for, for, the, for Vatican II, it, there's no such thing as a quality above man which lifts man towards God. Man is the highest, so it's a subnatural quality of man liberating his nature from sin. 
So the purpose of grace is liberty. Again, this emphasis on man in, in the place of God, liberty. What is faith? Faith is a super, for Catholics, it's a supernatural virtue of, of the submission of the mind to God's truths. Faith is the will pushing the human mind to accept truths which are above the human mind. Uh, the, the theorem of Pythagoras, that the square on the uh, hy hypotenuse of a right angle triangle is equal to the squares on the two other sides, that's a natural truth. I can work it out with my mind, my mind can grasp it. But that, that God is three and one and one and three, my mind can't grasp that. That Jesus Christ is present really, truly and substantially between, beneath the appearances of red and white, it's beyond my mind. It's a truth, it's a supernatural truth. I accept it because my will pushes my mind to accept it. And so my mind, my proud, natural intellect, submits itself to the truths of God. Uh, St. Paul calls the faith an obedience, because I am submitting my great mind, is not so great as all that, but my great mind I am submitting to truths even greater than it, by, by faith. It's that virtue by which my will and my mind submit, my will pushes my mind to submit to a, a greater tr truths above it, above its natural powers. The truths of the faith are above the natural powers of the human mind. They're supernatural truths. But I, because I, because I, I believe, because I have the faith, I submit my mind to whatever I know that the church teaches as truth which I must accept. I don't submit my mind to just anything above it, but to what the church, what God's own church tells me, I must submit my mind to, which is above the mind. Um, what is faith in the new religion? It's the personal experience of the religious mystery. 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 Because I said yesterday, you introduce the word mystery and then you can go anywhere with the argument. Because mystery. <laughs> mystery. So... Uh, I have experience of the mystery. And, and that, as we say, see later, results in charismatics. Where, where do you get this, ex this religious experience? Well, it's when everybody is rocking and rolling under the influence of the Holy Ghost, supposedly the Holy Ghost. Of course, it's not the Holy Ghost at all. But there you are. That's, that's why charismatics are flourishing in the church today. They're kind of the one thing that is flourishing. The rest is, dro is dropping dead. Um, so what is grace for? Um, it's a supernatural quality of man, a, a subnatural quality of man. Because now grace, grace was of God, lifting me towards God. Now it's going to be down beneath nature, lifted, pushing nature upwards to get out of sin, pushing nature towards liberty. Grace is the servant of liberty. Not of God. Um, we come to faith. The, 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 what is faith? And the person experiences the religious review. Then we come to revelation, tradition, and the German magisterium. What is revelation for Catholics? It's this, the, the collection of supernatural truths revealed by God through Christ and his church. That's, that's revelation. That's what the things that God reveals, and uh, revealed through Jesus Christ, and ongoingly through the Christ's church. Again, the supernatural mysteries that men can't get hold of by themselves, but they are revealed by God through Christ firstly, and then through, the, through his church for the rest of the time. What is revolution for Vatican II? It's the showing forth of the mystery in a living communion. So, uh, it's when we get we get together on Sunday morning or Saturday evening. I don't know. We get together and we're all experiencing the religious experience together. That's uh, revelation. The, the the Holy Ghost is revealing Himself to us all, and we all feel and experience the experience together. That's revelation. What is tradition then? Tradition is the changeless truths of God 
as handed down through the ages by his church. Traditio, from Latin tradu, tradere, tradidi, traditum, to hand down. So um, tradition is the handing down of the revelation of Jesus Christ uh, through the ages in the church. What is, for, what is it for Vatican II? Tradition is the church's truths living and evolving down the ages. In other words, changing. Changing according to men's needs. Not fixed according to the will of God, what God chose to reveal through Christ and which the church reveals faithfully, faithfully to what it received from Christ. I, instead, it is, um, it's what the community experiences of the religious mystery, and as the community evolves from one century to the next, down to the 20th and 21st centuries, so tradition is going to evolve. Tradition is no longer going to be fixed. Uh, tradition is going to be living, and the fixed tradition is going to be dead. And John Paul II in 1988 accused Archbishop Lefebvre, uh, when, he, when uh, uh, John Paul II condemned the consecration of four bishops by the Archbishop in 1988, he condemned him in the name of Vatican II and in the name of the paragraph out of one of the documents, De Verbum, saying that tradition evolves, tradition lives and evolves. So if tradition is not evolving, if tradition is supposedly always the same, which is what Archbishop Lefebvre was saying, then it's dead and it's not, it's not, it's not living, it's not the, tr the tradition of the church. God does not change and the truths that he reveals do not change. Tradition does not change. Finally, then, what is the magisterium? The magisterium for the, for the Catholics is that the church's changeless teaching together with God, the authority of God to teach that teaching. That's the magisterium for Catholics. What is it for um, Vatican II? is the religious mystery as experienced in man's communion. Again, we get together on Sunday morning, we all start rocking and rolling under the influence of the Holy Ghost, and whatever we come up with as a judgment of what the Church is teaching, that's the magisterium. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. I mean, it's unbelievable what a complete distortion and caricature of the truth is the teaching of Vatican II. We come to the church. What is the church? It's the society of believers in Christ, militant on earth, purging and triumphant in heaven. And the kingdom, of, the kingdom of God and the church on earth are the same thing, the same one same church. But for, the, for Vatican II, the two are different. The church is the visible organism of the kingdom of heaven on earth, and it's universal only at world's end. The kingdom of heaven is the invisible seed of the church on earth, visible only at world's end. So they've split the church, the modernists have split the church into church and kingdom of heaven. The church is going to be visible but not universal, no longer universal. The church is going to be, uh, the, the kingdom of heaven is going to be invisible and universal, uh, which, will be, which will become visible at the end. At the end of the world, the church and kingdom of heaven will again coincide, but for the moment they're split. This split enables the modernists to downgrade the church while pretending that it's still all that it used to be by the invisible kingdom of heaven in men's hearts. In other words, Christ, the kingdom of Christ's heaven is invisibly present in all Mohammedans' hearts. Do you believe that? I don't. <laughs> no. Um, men don't want Christ. And they don't want his kingdom of heaven. They don't want his God. They don't... No, no, no. So to pretend, to pretend that, the, that the Christ's kingdom, or the kingdom of Christ's heaven, that the true, the true kingdom of heaven is in all men's hearts. Our Lord says the kingdom of heaven is within you if you believe, but not if you don't believe. If you don't believe, you will still well easily be in a state of sin. If you do believe, you still have to go to confession to get out of the state of sin. So... There's much more to it than um, just what's invisibly in men's hearts. This idea that Christ is in men's hearts in such a way that all men are saved, that, that's nonsense. But that's the, that's the Vatican II teaching about the kingdom of heaven. The Pope is God's own monarch of God's own monarchy, which is his church. 
the Catholics. But as Father Calderon pointed out, points out, um, at one point, Pope John Paul II said, uh, the idea of the papacy may need a bit of adaptation. It may need a bit of tweaking to fit modern man. So he said something like that. He didn't use the word tweak, tweaking, of course, but that's exactly what he meant. The, the papacy may need some adaptation in order to be more democratic, to be less monarchical, to be less dictatorial. That's the word, you see. This idea that anything of God is a prison, and that man needs liberty, and therefore man must reject all the things by which God shapes, molds, and contains man, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. Liberty, liberty, liberty. You're going to read what? What the, the modern youth? A lot of modern youngsters today have liberty. What do they do with it? Just get drunk. Get drunk and drunk, because there's nothing there. The liberty, liberty for what? They're, they're free from maybe their parents' household. They're free from dad's restrictions whenever they have, to, whenever if ever they still go home. But what are they? What are they free for? Nothing there. Liberty is an empty concept for many people. Liberty from I know what I'm liberty. I know what I'm, I'm liberating myself from. But what am I liberating, liberating myself for? That's a different question. Um, so the papacy may need to be democratized for all men to accept it. That's John Paul II. It's not actually Vatican II directly. But it's certainly in line with Vatican II. Bishops, very, the, the bishops receive their jurisdiction only from the Pope above them. Above is an anathema word in the new religion. Nobody is allowed to be above. Everybody's got to be on the same level. Everything must be democratized. E liberty, equality, fraternity. Therefore, the Pope, uh, the bishops, receive their ju in, the, in the new church, receive their jurisdiction to teach and to rule from their sacramental consecration. That's in Lumen Gentium. The priests, they are the baptized men having received the sacrament of ordination, for Catholics, of course. But in the new church, both clergy, Catholic clergy and Catholic laity are priests in a broader sense, and they're ministering to all men. So you've got all Catholics are priests, and all the rest of mankind, all non-Catholics are members of the church, to whom the Catholics are ministering, priests and laity. That's a complete change of the concept of, church, of, 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 of priests and laity. The people of God are the Catholic clergy plus, for Catholics, plus the Catholic laity without any non-Catholics included. The non-Catholics, just as non-Jews were not part of the people of God in the Old Testament, non-Catholics are not part of the people of God in the New Testament. But, for Vatican II, all mankind, the new church priesthood and all non-Catholics, are part of the people of God. The people of God, for, for Vatican II, is enlarged to include absolutely everybody. Christendom. Christendom then what used to be all and only Catholic nations united inside the church. The new Christendom is all men on earth because all men are, quote-unquote, from Gaudium it says, all men are somehow united to Christ. Vatican II doesn't try to specify how they're united to Christ, but the, the pretense is that Christ by his incarnation, instead of Christ by his cross, saves us, and it's by united to Christ in his cross that we're saved and go, we go to heaven. No, just by his birth, which means we don't need the cross. So it's Christianity without the cross. Christ, just by his incarnation, so united himself to every human being that comes alive that um, the incarnation is enough for men's salvation. Nuts. Crazy. It's emptying out the cross. Then ecumenism. Ecumenism is, there is a true ecumenism, and the Catholic ecumenism is the outreach of the Catholic Church to all non-Catholics. Those were the missions, especially. The, the young men and the young the sisters that went to horrible climates with lots of mosquitoes and uh, tropical diseases in order to save souls amongst the native peoples. But that, all that, 
as Archbishop Lefebvre realized at the, at the time of Vatican II, he had been a great missionary in Africa for many years, of the 1920s, 1930s, 30s especially. Um, he was a very successful missionary and went back later, the 40s, 50s, to Africa and created 15, 16 dioceses. He so expanded the work of the church that, that the, he left French, uh, French Africa with 16 more dioceses than when he, when he arrived. Because he was apostolic delegate, he created dioceses. Imagine, 16 of them. That's missionary. And the Archbishop knew that the teaching of Vatican II, all men are saved, all men are Catholics, without baptism, without profession of faith. He knew, he said, this is going to wreck the missions. Sure enough. Why does anybody go to give their lives to the mosquitoes when all men are saved anyway? So Vatican II has wrecked the missions. And it's, it's wrecked vocations. Why, make my, why, why to go to the trouble of being a priest or being a sister when uh, everybody's saved? So the, um, for Vatican II, ecumenism means the value of the religious experience in all religions of men. If, if all men are so valuable, if all men are so wonderful simply by being men, what can be wrong with Islam and Hinduism, Judaism and all of the false religions? They're religions of men. Men are wonderful. All of these false religions must be wonderful. So there's no idea of true and false. True and false are, are disappearing. And together right and wrong are disappearing with right, true and false. Everything of God is disappearing. All that's left is man and his original sin. That's, that's the world around us today. Finally, the world. The world is that which is not the church. It's valuable only as a trampoline for Christians to jump on to get to heaven. Imagine a, a trampoline. You jump on it, you don't treat it with very great, very great respect, but you do use it to jump on in order to bounce. Well, the, the world is a, is, a, is a trampoline to bounce on to go to heaven. But for Vatican II, it's valuable in and for itself, regardless of the church, regardless of heaven, regardless of salvation. The world is, is just valuable in itself. What for? For this 70 years of life? And then what? Well, the, the, it's, it's an, it, Vatican II is a total revolution. Politics, essentially, our politics are essentially subordinate to the saving of souls. That's logical. If I stop and think about it, it's easy to think politics and religion should be separate. That's the modern idea. Church and state must be separate. Separation of church and state. No, no. Every single human being was created by God to go to God and to go to God by Christ, not by any other means. Then what's politics for? How can politics be for anything other or anything else? Therefore, politics are, politics are essentially subordinate to the true religion, not to any religion, but to the true religion. That's how it was in the Middle Ages. The Catholic Church governed or controlled was the politicians. The politicians, res the kings, respected the church. They were naughty boys sometimes, obviously. It's not as though the, the church in the Middle Ages abolished sin. No, but it fought sin. And it fought sin with all the good, with good principles, with, with truth. But, but from the end of the Middle Ages onwards, the truth began to be more and more diluted and politics began to, be, began to be more and more independent of the church until he reached them today, where uh, President, what's it, no, um, Governor Cuomo of, of um, here in New York, did he not say, oh no, we're in Connecticut actually, but next door New York, did he not say, I'm against abortion as a private citizen, but as a politician, uh, I, uh, I support it, something like that. It's di what, what kind of a division is that? What does he say when he goes in front of his maker? And he says, Lord, I, um, I practice your religion, but separately from my politics. my politics. My politics have nothing to do with your religion. Oh, says the Lord God. Oh, well, I have a warm place for you downstairs. <laughs> um, Chris, Vatican II, the politics are Christian without the church. In other words, the new church is not going to try, even try, to control 
to govern or guide or control the politicians. It's going to leave the politicians to do what they want. The view in the new church is going to admit, going to allow, going to grant that politics is completely independent of the church. Uh, and they are essentially in politics are essentially independent of the saving of souls. That makes no sense at all. What are human beings on this earth for except to save their souls? Even all the Jews and Muslims are only here to save their souls. If they know about saving their souls through Christ and refuse to do so, they also have a warm place down below. And that's where they will finish. Unless they're truly ignorant and have been taught errors and have never had a chance of learning the truth, then, well, then will, God will have mercy. But otherwise, if they've known the truth or could know the truth and refused to or declined to, with nothing, nothing on earth is independent of the saving of souls. This whole earth exists for the saving of souls, as a trampoline for souls to jump on and bounce on until they, get, they, they, until they bounce to heaven. Democracy. Um, in, for the Catholics, it's the eventually, not immediately, but it's eventually, it's the dissolution from below of any authority from above. That's what the democracy, democracy is not immediately there. If you've got a democracy of decent citizens, they will make a decent government. But what is going to maintain their decency? By telling them that they're marvellous as just as men, they're marvellous, that's not going to make them decent. It's going to make them proud, and it's going to make them misguided. So, but if the, if the citizens have a tradition of, Christ, of Christian civilization, like let's say in Switzerland for many centuries, then you form the, centuries and centuries of the, of the church make decent citizens, and decent citizens will, or will be capable of forming a decent government. But if the citizens are not decent, there will be no decent government. Democracy is good on condition that the citizens are good. Not otherwise. And the trouble is, with, with original sin, a democracy will usually slide downwards. A democracy will not usually slide upwards. Not usually. It might happen exceptionally, but not usually, because of original sin. So what is for democracy in the Vatican II? It's the sole, the one and only legitimate source of authority and the one and only legitimate basis of the society of men. Again, if you glorify men you're bound to arrive at democracy in politics. Because all men are good, all men are equal, they're all men are equally good. This ignorant so-and-so, this ignorant criminal, this is as good as a wise and prudent citizen on the basis of equality. No, it, it's, it's a, it's a no-no. Any final questions, perhaps, before we make our way home? Uh, yes? The comment on in New York... Um we're referring to Mario Cuomo. His son Andrew, um, last January, passed the law that allowed abortion up to birth. Yes. And independent of Cardinal Dolan, would not have to communicate. Yep. He, and he basically said it's a, it's, it's a means of punishment or something on that kind of line, which it's not, and it is, and just hands off, and now we're going to be being yep. to the term. Yep. So the independent. The church has, 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 has gutted itself. It's ruled itself out of the game. It's, it's said, we're powerless, we're not, we're, it's nothing to do with us. Those churchmen are going to answer before God for, for backing out of their responsibility. The churchmen who will back into their responsibility may well get martyred. They'll certainly get slaughtered in the newspapers, <coughs> slaughtered by the media. But that's the way to heaven. That that's, goes with the territory. If you want to stand for Almighty God and stand for the truth, then you've got to stand, you've got to make yourself unpopular. Any other questions or comments? Uh, okay, I'm going to ask you a question. Hands up and hand, hands up and hands down. Um, who, who finds that a useful revision of, what, of the last couple of days, of Friday and Saturday? Use of vision. Who does not find it useful? Okay, well then I'm I'm oriented. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much. Let me give you a lesson. Benedict Sudan Repetentis. Patris is Fili Espiritu Santi. The Shedat Sivavosit Mani Semper. Amen.